Um, we'll start out. Have you all ever heard that story about the man who had a, had a daughter? And they, they, they were church people and daughter goes to Sunday school. They get home and the father asks the daughter, well, what did you learn at Sunday school today? She may have heard this before. The daughter says, I heard that God's left-handed. What did they teach you? Where would you get that idea? She says, yeah, God's left-handed. Because Jesus Christ is sitting on his right hand. <laughs> and, and I tell that because I, I think a lot of us start out with that kind of a simple concept of who God is and about what he's doing. And a lot of that comes from religious experience, our involvement in church, you know. So we have come a long way. I mean, I can't tell you, when I started my journey as a, as a believer, when God first gave me the realization, I used to say, I was telling somebody else today, God, I used to say when I got saved, and that was the popular way to describe it. I didn't realize that I was already saved. God had already provided that salvation for me. He just was waiting for the time that he had determined to call me and give me the faith. And I began to realize later on as time went on, you know, this is just a continuing growing in a realization of grace. That, that verse in Colossians, that, that Paul's prayer, that you would continue to grow in the realization of God. Wow, this is what we've been doing. And the more we learn, the more fascinated I become about what we're learning and what we think we know, the more I find out well, there's more to learn. You know, we keep taking these steps, and man, it's just a vista keeps growing and growing and growing. So, the title is Where Do We Fit in Prophecy? Or Where We Fit in Prophecy? Do We Fit in Prophecy? Um, I want to start off by saying, Clyde, that this is the last time I leave my notes laying around because you stole all my material. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. And Steve said some stuff that I think, what? did you guys get together and plan this or something? Because I mean, we're talking about a, lot, about a lot of the same stuff. It all interrelates, you know. Sure. It's really interesting to me that he gave me these topics to study on and to, to teach. He had his topics. Did you talk to Steve at all, you know, sharing stuff about what you were going to be talking about? Or? No. And yet, here we are. We, we're, we're crossing paths here with us. That fascinates me. So, Many, many sincere believers want to know God's plans, and there's nothing wrong with that. I've, I've always had an interest, as Clyde said, in prophecy, but I just didn't know where it went. There's a lot of confusion on the subject. And due to many, you know, numerous mistranslations, misinterpretations of Bible scholars who were trying to teach about this, uh, just really ever since Paul, you know, almost two millennia since Paul, there's a lot of confusion about just exactly what, what to expect next in God's schedule of events. Uh, many people like me became utterly frustrated you know, with all the different ideas, especially when you look at all the prognosticators out there. And, and these prognosticators go all the way back to Paul's day. They do. In fact, you could even say before that, because there have been false prophets even in the, in the Hebrew scripture times. Um, so we know that something's wrong. Has, every, has any, anybody else here ever been interested in prophecy? You know, you know but ha have you ever really pursued it? Well, you tried. You know, I did anyway. And so along the way I began to realize there's something wrong with this picture. Now, what is prophecy? Prophecy is nothing more than a foretelling or predicting. Uh, especially as we, we are concerned with God's plan and purpose. Um, Genesis 20, verse 7 is the first mention of the pro of prophet, the word prophet, when God spoke to Abimelech that Abraham was his prophet. Now, E.W. Bolger's companion Bible it says that a prophet is, or a prophecy is showing that prediction is only a small part of its meaning. And it, a prophet is God's spokesman. And we, we see references to Aaron, Moses' brother, in, in Exodus 4.16. Uh, you, you remember the story that when, when Moses was out in the, uh, in the desert after he left Egypt, 
not in the desert, but where he ultimately ended up. And God heard the cry of his people Israel, sends Aaron to meet his brother Moses at the foot of that mountain where Moses eventually received God's commandments. So he said, he's going to be my spokesman, basically. Because Moses is saying, when God was telling him what he's going to do, I'm not the man. Mm. You know, three times I think you know, God was telling him, and Moses denies, I, I can't do this. I, I don't have. A, I'm not. I don't have good speaking habits and what have you. I paraphrase a lot of things, by the way. <laughs> um, so okay, I'll send you Aaron, your brother. So Aaron came along, and he was the mouthpiece <clears throat> for God through through Moses. So he was just foretelling what God was going to do, what God wanted him to say, what he wanted everybody else to know. Um, I, I like the statement by E.B. Pusey, who lived from 1800 to 1882. Prophecy is not given to us to enable us to prophecy, but as a witness to God when the time comes. Okay. So the act or the, the, a person who is a prophet is witnessing what God's plans are to those to whom it applies. Now, here's the question. A lot of people have this question here, I'm sure. Do we live in a time when God still operates within the realm of prophecy? And if so, where and who are his prophets? Well, I worked a long time on this to come up with this answer. And, and the answer to the first question is no. That's it. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> Been all those months of study. Uh, there, there's a lot of detail that we could talk about, but we're just going to speak about prophecy, and this is the thing that a lot of Christians are uh, concerned about today, like the latter days, right? The end times, yeah. the imminent return of Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the reason they're concerned about it is because they've been sold a false bill of goods about. Christ's return. It's a scary thing. We see the passages that talk about all the, the, the violence and the evil that's going to be going on in those latter times. And so what religion has done, and, and I say this especially about Christianity, they've taken that and applied it today. But first thing, let's talk about the law of false prophets. The prophet who presumes to speak a word of my name, and this is my paraphrase of Deuteronomy 18 verses 20 through 22. The prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name or speaks in the name of other gods, which is the word Elohim, which I have not commanded him to speak, that prophet shall die. Ooh. I, I, I'm going to hold up on filling out the form for signing up for that job. So the, the, the question is asked, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? And God's answer was, if, that, if what was prophesied doesn't happen, in other words, if a prophet, if a so-called prophet, made a prediction about something that God, that he says God was going to do, or this was going to happen, and it didn't happen, he's lying. He's a false prophet. And guess what? The penalty for that is death. That prophet shall die. Now, it didn't say the false prophet. It said that prophet. There are a lot of prophets in the world today. We see them on the Weather Channel all the time. <laughs> A lot of false prophets here. Um, so if you look at chapter 13 in Deuteronomy as well, there are false prophets also who tempt others to worship other gods. The penalty for those also is death. Mm -hmm. So either getting them, getting somebody to try to seek what you were talking about, these gods that were not the true and only God, was a false prophet. So, if we're still living in the days of prophecy, our history would be littered with a trail of the bones of the false prophets who predicted the mm. latter days and times. Exactly. And the coming of the Lord, you know, his imminent return. You, know, you better get right with the Lord. Right. You know, we've heard that very often. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if you want a really detailed analysis of all of this, and, and I'm sure there could be even more detail, Clyde's book, Seven Things I Misunderstood About Prophecy is an excellent, outstanding resource for that. He has appendices in there that give you a long line 
of people who have gone before and, and promised that they knew when the Lord was coming back. And yet, the day passed. It didn't happen. Well, what happens next? Well, they either retreat in shame, or they come out, oh, I just found out. I forgot to do this or add that. Here's the new date. That day passes. Some have learned them, some of them did. So, there are several eschatological positions. Eschatology is the study of end times. It's a theological field uh, that, that looks at the scriptures and tries to determine what's happening and when. And I have a big, thick book by uh, Dwight Pentecost. I started reading that book and I thought, I don't even know what this guy's talking about. I mean, it was just confusion. Now, let's talk about the four basic uh, positions. There's premillennialism, which determines that Christ returns before and reigns during the, uh, his millennial reign, okay, during what we call the millennial, millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ. Then there's postmillennialism. Christ returns after the millennium, after Christianity successfully converts most people in the world to the Great Commission. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. A millennialism is people or the system that believes that there is no millennial reign of the righteous on earth and that the 1,000 years is just a symbolic thing. And it's, it's already begun and it's simultaneous with the current church age. Uh, and then there's preterism, which means basically some are all, and I, I'm sure people could provide some other information that could correct or even add to some of this, but basically preterism is some or all Bible prophecies are already fulfilled. Now, when I had re been reading a lot of books, I had, I had bookshelves full of, you know, all these <coughs> topics about when the Lord's going to come, you know, the, the 666, I remember that one because it was a blazing cross. This book. And, and I'm sure many of you have read them, you know. And I would read them and I'm thinking, wow, this is interesting. This, he's quoting verses and it seems like it's right. But again, all of these were abject failures in their ability to correct and predict what they were saying was going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I became very frustrated at this general, it, just that the whole general confusion reigned in, in that whole system of eschatology, uh, especially in light of these numerous failed predictions. So although I didn't recognize it, I, I basically was a preterist because <laughs> I just gave up on it. And I thought, well, you know what? If, if there is any prophecy to be fulfilled, God's going to handle it. But I, I didn't even know if that was true, if any prophecy was going to be fulfilled. Now, postmillennialism especially is, is an important aspect of this because, you know, this is where a lot of Christianity gets their position. You've heard of dominion theology, has anybody oh, yeah. ever heard of that? This, this is what they think. They think that it's their job to, to get the world right, get humanity right, and then get everything right and perfect, and then when the Lord comes back, you, they'll hand it over to Him, yeah. and He'll bless them for all their wonderful hard work. Well, that's working well. Yeah, isn't that going great? <laughs> yes, it is. Wow. So this is the main, the main thrust that I see that Christianity has. Now again, there are different flavors of any of these. And I went along, it was, I, I didn't really get, get involved with, uh, with prophecy for quite a good time. Uh, and the thing I began to realize as I began to learn about prophecy was that basically, you know, Christianity is robbing Israel of their covenant and their promises. They're robbing Israel of the things that God had given them to be the nation of priests and the world. See, that's what Christianity thinks. Some think that they're the replacement of the lost tribes of Israel. Some, some people think that they have a great commission. Some think that they've got these gifts and signs. Ever, ever, anybody ever watched Benny Hinn? Yeah. Another yeah. like him? Heal! Yeah. So... There, there's a lot of confusion about this subject. Finally, after all this time of laying off prophecy, but still having an interest in it, every now and then I come across something, try to pick it up and see what it says, eh, same old stuff. Um, I came across, well, one of the first articles that I remember reading that, that really opened my eyes 
and this, I had been with Clyde for some time, but back in issue 735, which is the September 3rd, 2018 issue of the Bob Sue's Notebook, we published an article by Sellers, and, and, and that's part of the premillennial, or rightly dividing Israel's prophetic kingdom book. I call it PMK, short for premillennial kingdom. Uh, that, sh that really opened my eyes, and I began to think, oh my gosh, here's a ray of light that makes, makes me think it's possible that we can know some things about prophecy. We can know what God's plans are. And so I, you know, I still wasn't sure if we were fitting in any of that anywhere, but besides the, the provably wrong predictions of the past and continuing false prophets, how else do we know that we're not living in a time of active prophecy? Now, I'm going way too slow. Um, the key here is correctly cutting the truth. It's critical. It's 2 Timothy 2.15, King James, rightly divided the word through. Um, I, like the, I like the correctly partitioning idea as well, Clyde. Um, so this whole issue pivots on this key. I, shortly after I came into to, to knowledge of God and salvation and all that, um, one of the first publications I read was Richard Jordan's The Key to Understanding the Truth. That's a great little booklet. It gives you some real great basic information about understanding where things fit, where they belong, where you belong. Um, so, without with, you know, understanding that, confusion reigns. Even after knowing that stuff, I, I remember reading through Paul's epistles, not really understanding Acts and the post-Acts and all that stuff. Like, Paul, uh, like Clyde said, you, know, you try to mix everything together, it just became one big mess. Okay? Because there's, there's confusion in not understanding what Paul's saying over here and reali not realizing that it doesn't apply over here, post-Acts. You know, a lot of stuff Paul says in, in his Acts epistles don't fit this mystery dispensation, okay? And that's what correctly partitioning is all about, understanding that God's doing something different, something special today. Um, and so it, another way you may have heard this stated is things that are different are not the same, okay? Now, let's talk about some of the things that are not different today. Paul had been brought up with false charges in Acts 26 by the religious and rebellious Jews who accused him of preaching and teaching against the Jewish religion and desecrating the temple. Mm -hmm. In fact, he was in, in the temple one day talking to the Jews, because that was his practice, to the Jews first and to the Gentiles. And he, he was given a speech, and he, the last word he said before there was an uproar was Gentile. You know, talking about the Gentiles. This drove the, the, the Jews in the temple mad because they were dogs. Yeah. They, they, they consumed to be lower than low. And so they, they sought to take Paul's life, and that was the beginning of his of an imprisonment of his. So, but in Acts 26, he's defending himself. He finds himself standing before King Agrippa, defending his uh, activities up to this point. He says uh, to King Agrippa, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue to this day witnessing both to small and great, saying, None other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. None other things. Mm -hmm. is, is he doing something over here that he's doing over here? No, over here, he said, I'm just doing what's, what's part of Israel's program. Moses, the prophets. This is Israel. Prophets, Moses, okay? Um, so he only spoke those things in Acts that were in accordance with what had been previously spoken or revealed to Israel. Nothing new, nothing that wasn't before known, and he proclaimed the hope of Israel, you see in Acts 20 and 20. That's what he said he was trying to do, proclaiming the hope of Israel. Well, God, if we're in a mystery, why are we talking about the hope of Israel? Well, that's because they're two different things. All right. Paul's not talking about the mystery when he's talking about the hope of Israel, Okay. We don't see this thing about the mystery until after Acts and his epistles there. So let's just go by some real quick distinctions. He mentioned grafted. They're being grafted. That was part of the prophecies that, that said that, that the Gentiles will be proselytized, basically, into Israel's program. Okay? But we find in Romans that th that was done to drive Israel to jealousy because they were not doing the job that, that God came to do. Even after Christ came, it proved himself, you know, and this was really a, a large 
in large part due to Israel's religious establishment. They rejected him. They're the ones who, for the most part, put him on, you know, they killed him, they murdered him. We see a difference in distinction. Anybody ever see that movie Night and Day? K-N-I-G-H-T and Day, it's with Tom Cruise. Yeah, I love that part where he says, with me, without me. Talking about her chances of surviving because you know, <laughs> with me, without me, I love that. So, I'm gonna say, that's sort of like what we're talking about here. You see a wall? With a wall, all that stuff that's going on, excuse me, over here, with a wall, I should be over here too, because you can see the season. With the wall, over here, okay, and this is it, not working out the way I want it to. All these things, you know, the, the things <coughs> concerning Israel, prophecy, gifts, healing signs. We see those mentioned in Acts by Paul, and in fact, he talks about his Acts epistles. We see that as related to Israel. We've already talked about a lot of that. With a wall, without the wall. With the wall, without the wall. And that's exactly what you were talking about. You want to make determination about what belongs to us today. If it's related to Israel and their gifts and their program, we have nothing to do with it. You don't, you get to Acts or post Acts and look at Paul's epistles, you know, we see a lot of things that, that are talked, well, I'll give you a good example, Ephesians 2, 2.19. He talks about there, that there's no more Jews and Gentiles, there's no distinction. Acts 28, 28, low am I, not my people. God's done with Israel temporarily. He set them aside. Um, therefore, they're no longer nation. All the things of Israel above, well, what I mentioned before about gifts, prophecy, signs, and so on, that's, that's done. We have nothing to do with that stuff. Nothing. Um, and in Ephesians 2.19, he talks about Jews and Gentiles being fellow citizens in one body, Jew and Gent. Now, in that same verse, he talks about you know, how, how the Jew, uh, Gentiles are without hope, without God in the world. Okay? Also, we learned that the, the, the uh, I think you may have mentioned this, Clyde, that the Gentiles were, were strangers to the covenants. Mm -hmm. right? Strangers. Well, guess what? Today, same verse, we're fellow citizens, joint body. Now, Paul heard some things in 2 Corinthians. He, he wrote about it. He says, I, I went up to heaven and I, I heard some things that were, or a man heard some things that are unlawful to be spoken. Yeah. I think he heard some things about the mystery. He couldn't reveal it during that time. Yeah. In 2 Corinthians, word, which is during the Acts period. <coughs> Why? Because God was still dealing with Israel. As long as God's dealing with Israel, the, the mystery was hidden. God hid that mystery in himself before the foundation of the world, throughout the ages, until he revealed it to and through Paul. This is our program for today. Uh, something the seekers don't know. You can't trace it out. You can't search for it. Especially if it's in God. Oh, we can find secrets and stuff in the scriptures. But this particular secret dealing with the dispensation of the mystery is secret. Okay? God's not doing anything with Israel today. There's a joint body. We have a joint fellowship, citizenship. Um, and that, that's our calling. And well, I like, uh, I forget who said this now, but oh, Mark. We're talking about Believer's Boot Camp. That's exactly what we're here doing. When I was in the military, we went through, well, I don't know about you, but I went through boot camp. And I'll tell you what, it was rough. It was a whole different world. <laughs> how, many, how, how many of you have found out some of these things about what we're learning concerning this mystery? Paul the Apostle, our Apostle, dispensation of grace. How many of you got introduced to that and thought, man, this is some rough territory. This is rough times. Oh, I, I don't understand this. You know, it's like when you go to boot camp. You're introduced to a whole new world, you know. And what it's doing is preparing you for what, what's coming after, the assignment that's, that you're going to have. This is our job. This is what Clyde's doing. When I'm, this is my heart. I, I want to help prepare people for that by being a part of that process that, that informs and educates edification of the body, edifying, building up. Right? And so I'll leave it off here. 
it, we talk about the secret. Well, something that's secret is unknown, unknowable, and this is not prophecy. In fact, it's the converse. Prophecy and the mystery are mutually exclusive. You can't mix them. It's like oil and water. Okay? What happens when you take oil and water mixed together? You, get, you shake it up, and it's like <laughs> kind of a mess, isn't it? You know? That's, that's what happens when you try to mix prophecy and the, and the mystery. So we can find prophecy from Genesis through Acts and Hebrews through Revelation. But you're not going to find anything about that in Paul's, Paul's uh, post-Acts epistles. All of this that we put up in this chart in that preliminary kingdom book, all of this is prophecy regarding Israel. Israel, what God's going to do with them. The vast majority, I'll tell you this, the vast majority, we'll go over some things. Um, in the next talk, the vast majority of, of prophecy in the Bible is really about this whole period of time, okay? Until the thousand years okay, of Christ. Israel hasn't experienced any of this yet. Although Christianity would like to make you think it has passed. And I'll, I'll reveal more about that in the next talk. Thank you.